Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. I am to tell you who I am. I do that quickly. I am Reverend Gary Harriot. I am General Secretary for the Jamaica Council of Churches and I serve as Secretary for the Jamaica Honorable Groups of Churches. On the panel, we have Bishop Wilton Powell, from the his immediate past National Overseer of the Church of God of Prophecy, UK and France. Then, um, Mr. Rudy Page, Rafa International Development Agency, and then Bishop Ransford Jones, who is the CEO Destiny Community Outreach Program, um, Toronto and Chairman for the Jamaican Canadian Christian Alliance. As I trust by now you're aware, the theme for this panel discussion is Calls That Cannot Be Broken, the role of the diaspora church in Jamaica's socio-economic development. And the objectives are to identify ways the church in Jamaica and in diaspora can work together practically to bring transformation to Jamaica, to agree three key aims for the entity and outline essentials of accountability framework required to govern the entity to be established. And third, to specify at least three initiatives on which the entity will begin work in the next two years. I'm not sure we will be able to accomplish all of that in 45 minutes. But first, we'll invite the members of the panel to make some brief comments. And as was said, we want to not go into the long dissertation, but to get to specific, concrete ways, maybe inspired by what you will hear from the panel, or maybe there are other ideas on the floor that you want to put to us, practical ways in which the church in Jamaica and diaspora may work together to bring about transformation in Jamaica. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to invite uh, Bishop Powell uh, to come first, followed by Mr. Page, and then by Bishop Jones. Thank you, moderator. In the expediency of time, I'll move as quickly as I can. In this situation, uh, I'll move to the point that is the logical base for what we're doing has already been established. It's important for us going forward to realize that there's a context for which we have it. If you go to the Lausanne 1973 covenant, Decla covenantal declaration, it sets a context that churches everywhere should be relevant to their communities in the sense of presenting the gospel touching communities, making transformation. Because we acting together as a church sometimes are unsure whether we are to act or not. We go back to scripture, James second chapter points out clearly if your faith is without works, it is dead. So therefore, the basis for action is already there. The context for action is also set by the, by, uh, the across the landscape with churches embracing the Lausanne, Lausanne staff, covenant. I make this third point, and that is strategic action. If you've noticed that the sustainable goals as outlined by the United Nations are relevant to the presenting of the gospel in context, and it applies globally. It speaks to the situations globally. And when I saw the response to, to Matthew the other day, I could see the disparities in this community in Jamaica. We could see those persons at the centers and there were people in other places who, who were comfortable in their homes. So we could see the inequalities in wealth and so forth. Sustainable goals means that, as has been said by Dr. Henry, no one left behind. So I'm focusing on the issue of addressing the, the, the economics in the rural area in the sense of bringing and being practical in linking education, health, and productivity in those areas, enabling those persons to be a part of the productive forces. I tried to find some figures, for example, what is the contribution towards the GDP of those persons in the rural areas? 
I, the best estimate I could get is 7%. That is quite low when you consider the population, consider the land, consider all of those other things. And when you look at it, churches are in every town, every village, every parish, and if every church takes on that sense, I'm going to be relevant in my area, delivering something that I know is commissioned by the gospel, I can make a difference in my community. It's about equipping, it's about strategizing, and I say this, that leadership, pastors, bishops, leaders within churches, you are just as much a strategist as any other strategist to be found anywhere. Because Jesus said, if a man is to build a tower, you must first sit and count the cuts. It means you need to evaluate the circumstances, look at it, and then implement your ideas. So we'll talk more about it. I'll give you the case studies later on. Thank you. Greetings conference. My name is Rudy Page and I'm the advisor for RAFA. RAFA stands for Renewal, Advancement, Financial Freedom and Autonomy. It comes from Jehovah RAFA and it, it's an independent charity that was initi initiated by the Church of God of Prophecy in the UK. And what makes RAFA different is that uh, it's about delivery, program implementation and working out in the community. Now since I retired from that role, I still act as an advisor and I've gone on to do some further work around the role of the diaspora and working here in Jamaica and the Caribbean region as a whole. So I've recently authored some work called the Caribbean Diaspora Delivery System, which is a facilitated framework for the digital transformation of the traditional diaspora leadership, management and involvement model by providing strategic leadership in governance, structures and implementation. And why this is important, and it's been touched on today, that it's, it, it is important that we link trade and doing business with the jobs and our sustainable communities. And a good example of that, a recent World Bank report stated Reliable logistics is indispensable to integrate global value chains and reap the benefit of trade opportunities for growth and, opportun growth and poverty reduction. Bishop Powell's just stated the importance of rural communities and, and uh, providing jobs and ensuring that, that they are also included in the supply chains of the economy. Again, in a recent World Bank report, a good example, if we talk about purchasing power of our local churches and church-related organisations, 70 to 90 percent of the food consumed in the tourism industry is imported. So that represents a good opportunity for rural communities if we can get some organisational structures. And that can be really supported between the church, its related industries, and those professionals who, who are linked to the church. In the UK, we were awarded the passing for a program called Passing the Baton, and this is for the London 2012 Olympics, and it, and it recognised the top grade projects. And our program was inspiring peaceful, caring, and enterprising neighbourhoods. And basically, what we were saying, and we ran events all around the country between the church. RAFA and other stakeholders, we said that we needed inclusive communities and neighbourhoods. And you needed to have a dialogue in those communities. And the church is a place we can be trusted. We've got churches in all the communities so we could host them. And there were three basic things in terms of these dialogues. First was involving communities and neighbourhoods in the design development and delivery of community development programs or projects, improving young people's skills and workforce opportunities and enterprising opportunities, developing partnerships between churches and related agencies, education institutions, healthcare systems, sports and culture organisations. And I mentioned health because we've been very strong on health in particular. 
Many people don't realise that the mobile blood collection unit that reached Jamaica last year was in fact, behind that was Rafa and the Church of God of Prophecy. And I guess part of my key message also for the conference is the church is important to be inspirational, provide, to provide the blessing, but also there are domains where at the end of the day we need the professionals in the institutions to do what needs to be done to serve the public. And as we all say, there are only three goals in any system. It doesn't matter what public service that we're involved in, and that's high quality, so we have to deliver high quality services, whether it's care, easily accessible, it must be, everyone should be able to access it, we shouldn't have underserved communities, and if we have them, we should have clear programs of how we're going to ensure that they have access, and finally, finally, sustainable, sustainable services. And it's obvious because there's only a certain amount of budget going around. So but if we can link the church, its related agencies, and the other public policy makers, and the, those who do program implementation, we get the knowledge transfer, we get the, cap the capacity building, and we get people with a proven track record of, of delivery involved and then that will improve the li livelihoods for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's wonderful to be here with you today to share in this special inaugural uh, session. This is indeed a unique opportunity for the churches in the diaspora in Jamaica to unite and collaborate, to mobilize the believers, to galvanize the resources and unite but intentional actions to make a significant impact in the diaspora and Jamaica's sustainable socio-economic development. The question is, if not now, when? If not us, who? Lovely the church has considerable leverage to the divine capital. We know how to access and appropriate and apply it. I believe we must not only impact the lives of the people by the grace of God, but by the goodness of God, through the good works of the Christian church. We must not only be the example of the good Samaritan, we must be the good Christian. I believe, therefore, that this conference augments that perspective. Because when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with great compassion, and he did something tangible for them. I believe the church has a fundamental moral responsibility in the sustainable development of the nation. If there is a country whose psychic has been popularized by the church, it is Jamaica. And we give God thanks for the influence the church has in this great country. The Canadian diaspora churches want to play an integral role in Jamaica's sustainable development. And as indicated by the Economic Growth Council, they want to harness the energy of the diaspora. We have identified 10 critical areas as our you know, strategic analysis where we think we can contribute collaboratively with the assistance of some strategic influential partners like JAMPRO, Jamaica Tourist Board, influential educators, government and businesses. We will network with other like-minded organizations to coordinate resources and provide services. We will develop a framework and some guiding principles to facilitate the identifiable strategic imperatives. These will not only be quantitative in nature, but qualitative, measurable, and achievable. We have 10 areas that we have identified, and we believe that if these are given the priority attention, I believe that they can reap great benefits for Jamaica and the diaspora. Some of them will be long-term and some of them will be short-term. We look at economic development, the key to growth and progress and prosperity. We know how the diaspora through money transfer has positively changed the landscape and lives of many people here in Jamaica. With a $40 billion investment, we can capitalize on that in areas of trade, investment, tourism, science, and technology. On education, which is the key to a sustainable, progressive, and developing country. We will cooperate in training, accessing funding, and providing needed resources to enhance the educational process. 
on youth engagement and empowerment to develop a framework that will produce opportunities for youth, a mechanism that will provide opportunities for development through education, training, and employment with discipline and character development. Family ethics, building strong, connected family that will leave a legacy that is sustainable through biblical principles and positive cultural norms. Security and crime and violence and corruption. We'll attend to that by utilizing sheer experts and experiences through intelligence, best practices, and a concerted effort to provide resources to create the environment for security. This success and sustainable development depends on how we address the elephant in the room, which is crime, violence, and corruption. But as the Governor General says, there is nothing that is so wrong with Jamaica that cannot be fixed with what is right about Jamaica. Through immigration, settlement, and advocacy, very important to the viability of immigrants, we must hold government and society responsible on how human rights and racism is dealt with on the other side. We look at faith foundations. The mandate, the mantra, the message of the gospel must be the cornerstone of our idealism for the pursuit of progress and the prosperity of our societies. We look at social services. We will ensure that the sustainable and equitable services are done using best practices to enhance the Jamaican system and to ensure that the diaspora needs are met. We look at also health and wellness through educational and experiential practices. We will assist in providing resources and human capital to ensure an awareness of healthy life choices. And lastly, charity and philanthropy. To identify needs and projects to assist and resource people so that they can develop and grow in the system. The impact of the end results that we're looking for is change. Change that will inspire, especially our young people. That their lives will be improved, create opportunities, especially for the marginalized, disenfranchised, and demonized people in our society. The Canadian Diaspora Alliance is committed to the sustainable development of Jamaica and the diaspora. Our mission and value principles will propel us to ensure a consistent coordinated approach to identify, access, manage, and deploy resources and services to respond to the diverse needs of Jamaica and the diaspora. We will leverage our influence and resources to make it happen. God bless you and may God bless Jamaica land we love. Thank you very much, uh, members of the panel. Quite a bit has been said and the challenge usually in these events. We don't have enough time to pull them apart. But any question from the floor, question for clarity? We want to like to ask a question, and then maybe we could see if, out of all that we have heard, could we identify two or three things that you think we should give focus attention on? Uh, maybe the panels could tell us if there are things that they are presently working on in Jamaica. We hear the Canada's list, a long list of a number of things. Um, Rudy did give us some insight into some things that they are doing. But maybe there are particular things that you are working on at the moment that you think that we could galvanize our time and energy around. But any questions from the floor? Yes? Could you just get your microphone, please? Hi, I'm Mike Lippoons from the National Association for the Family. I'd like to thank the bishops for their comments, very valuable and insightful comments. And I have a question to pose, not just to the panelists, but to the conference as a whole. I had an experience recently where a young pastor was asked about the devotions in a school, and he was specifically instructed not to talk about Jesus Christ or to share the gospel to students. Now, I know for a fact that we all realize and recognize that the minds of our children are part of the battleground for what is happening a lot of our schools and uh, our society as a whole, where our children are being taught certain things 
Now we also know that the church, many of our churches are denominations, were the bodies that start a lot of these schools and they still have boards and so on. My question is, uh, and also I should say that our children are being taught right now certain things about uh, human sexuality, marriage and so on, the family, or not being taught. So the question I have is this, do you think as a church, as a people of God, we are being good stewards and custodians of what is being taught to our children in our schools um, in terms of, especially in terms of marriage and family and human sexuality and spreading the gospel. Because as I said, uh, that pastor was told as he conducted the motion that he's not to talk about the gospel and share it. And we've heard the periodic quotes, for example, that Christian guidance councils, they need to be removed from our schools. Are we, as the people of God, as a church, do you think we're being good stewards or as God requires us and custodians of what is being shared and taught to our children? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jones. All right. I think, do we have anyone on the floor who would want to respond? What I found interesting is you said that the prophet was invited to do devotions. So I'm not too sure what devotion would be if you're not to talk about faith. Yes. Anybody would want to make a comment on that? Yes? Yes, Woodrow Thompson, 10. I think one of the things we need to understand is that we uh, actually, let me back up, that's a loaded question. My first responsibility is to teach my children from home. I think that school, when I grew up in Jamaica, whatever was taught in the home was reinforced in school. That is no longer case. So many times what we teach, what is taught in the home, when our kids go back to school or university or college, uh, those things are looked at as being foolish. So to answer the question, and this would be a larger conversation, is I think that we as Christian parents have to start the work in the home. Must start in the home. So that when our kids go to school, if that is not reinforced, at least we've done a good job doing it in school. And I'd like to go a bit further. It is not the church's responsibility, now hear me carefully, to teach our kids first. It must start in the home. The church should help with that, but I'd like to push back and say, home is where the foundation must be laid. So that even when our kids go to school and go to university and professors are trying to tell them, uh, ever, about evolution, about creationism, we need to make sure that the foundation is laid in the home. Okay. So what we're seeing is that, and I was one of the, the, the speaker before, I commended it because what I wanted to tell him is that if you do the research in North America, for example, the church is being pushed to the fringes. The church is no longer engaged in having conversation with politicians and things like that. It's being pushed like such Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I would also say that we still have some advantage here in Jamaica. Um, we still have some connection with our leaders. We still have a significant influence in our schools. So we have to sit down and decide how it is that we are going to take on uh, this matter. Can we get a sense of the time? Our time people? Our ten minutes. So can we focus on what are some of the practical things that you think the church in the diaspora and the church in Jamaica could work on together? Yes. Uh, Reverend Kelly, this is more of a comment and I suspect that uh, those specific things will come later. I'm Beverly Stewart. Uh, I am the tourism specialist at the Jamaica Social Investment Fund. And I would like to comment on two items that were raised during the discussions. The first thing is about the, um, the importation of food for the tourism industry. And the other thing is the comments about the agrarian, uh, the rural. Uh, I work on the Rural Economic Development Initiative uh, at the Jamaica Social Investment Fund. And just to mention from the agricultural uh, standpoint, 
my agricultural specialist is not here, both of us are Christians. Uh, we feel that this is a calling, both in the area of agriculture and in tourism. And I know that the kind of greenhouse technology that has been uh, initiated and innovated in Jamaica uh, has contributed significantly. What we are able to do is to provide food for the hotels on a consistent basis. Uh, this was not, being, not able to be done before when farms had very small, uh, small plots. They're now working together in very large uh, communities very, very successfully. This is one of the hotels that um, you know I know was initiated. The other area is the area of tourism. And two weeks ago, uh, I launched, we launched uh, the National Community Tourism Portal, moretojamaica.com. Please go on. And uh, one of the practical things that you can do is that when you come to Jamaica, part of your holiday should be going into the communities. The objective is to make sure that there are jobs and there is revenue being generated so that food can be put on the table, children can go to school, uh, children can be going to universities where that was not facilitated before. So a practical thing that you can do is book a part of your holiday to go into the communities. Uh, some of them are already um, on, the, on the portal. We're starting with a small number, but it's a national program that is open to any kinds of communities that can be licensed by the Jamaica Tourism Board. So we're doing stuff in agriculture, we're doing stuff in tourism, there's still a lot more that needs to be done, but I just need to let you know that we have started. We have to pay this money back, by the way. So we have to generate, um, you know, Thank you. to be able to do that. Thank you, Bev. Thanks, thanks for this conference. Because I have not seen Bev in a long time. And she's speaking to something that I have a passion about as well. Many of our churches, especially in rural Jamaica, have lands underutilized or not utilized at all. And there are people are unemployed, so we need to bring those together. I think I have who want to see. Um, just want to make a comment. There is out there tremendous fear that has been created about Jamaica as a whole. I have been coming to Jamaica on a regular basis for well, years traveling. And I've found Jamaica to be a place I can travel. And I'm only, there are problems, I'm not denying that. But we must do something to counteract the fear that is out there. Because if you look at the figures of tourism and the incidents of tourism, there are millions of tourists that come to Jamaica. And the incidents that, that occur with tourism in terms of violence and all, it's extremely low, well below 1%. Near to zero. So, therefore, when you begin to balance those things and look where the, the nature of violence, where it occurs, and, and, and who occurs, to whom it happens, and all of that, it tells us something about what's happening in Jamaica. And we need to address that balance because the areas of the terrain which damages the economy and answering your question, we'd love to speak out of it because we also need to visit us. We visit you regularly. But well, please visit, travel to Europe, Canada, North America, and speak about it and speak with confidence because Jamaica is just another place with problems that the whole world has problems. Thank you very much. Yes? Uh, thank you very much. I'm Carla Dunbar. I'm a marriage, family, and sex therapist. And I'm very, very interested in the continuity of family life as God intended and marriage as God intended. And whilst I agree with both persons who spoke before me in terms of looking at how family values are passed on, and my, my other brother spoke to the fact that we are living in a postmodern world and therefore we need to look at how we live it, how we speak to our faith. Other groups, other religious entities are not limiting how they speak. I just came back from the um, Religion and Diplomacy Conference in Washington, D.C., and I saw agendas being pushed very openly uh, against family values as God intended. Talking about practical solution, we still need to, yes, the home has to be the first place. That's the foundation. It has to be the first place. And the church, of course, is an agent of socialization, and we continue that. 
Thy grandson at six years old was told to draw a picture of God and he drew a picture of his father. He said he had never seen God, but his father most likely depicts what he thinks God would look like. We need to continue to teach the kind of family value that God wants us to teach the nuclear family as God intended it to be and speak to the sustenance and the building of the family. If we are rebuilding Jamaica, we cannot rebuild Jamaica from the top now. We have to rebuild it from the bottom. Oh. Thank right. you. And a practical approach, my practical approach is now I have drawn up a plan, I have a proposal on the table for a family enrichment intensive program okay. that is intended to help resuscitate and restore the family. Thank you, Carl. Because in fact, one of the things that I think as to what we need to, one of the practical things is how we create opportunities for the empowerment of families. Um, we say quite a bit about families, but in terms of equipping families, parents to provide parenting, it's something that the church can become even more involved with um, as a practical engagement. Yes, Cody, please come. Thank you. You were asking what practical projects between churches in the UK at, or the diaspora and here in Jamaica. At the moment, we're, we're running blood drives and um, the Kiwanis clubs of Jamaica have been involved with those. And in the UK, we, we've started, to work, started to, to work with the local NHS providers for our churches to, be, to host health events, health information, information advice and guidance. So here in Jamaica, a very practical program would be just for our churches across the nation to host the blood drives. With the National Blood Transfusion Services, the Blood Bank in Kingston, and you've got the, um, the services from Cornwall Hospital. So that would be a great coordinated effort across the country if we could do that. And that's a partnership between the churches, the diaspora, and the um, National Blood Transfusion Services. That's very easy to do. Thank you very much. So that's another practical idea. We have just about three minutes. I've seen somebody standing. Yes, is that Al? Yes. It looks like him. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to practically, what can we do between the Church of Jamaica and the diaspora? I think we've, we can only begin a process of dialogue, but I think we've got to just face the base problem is always going to be the issue of economics and uh, finances. How do we finance the kinds of programs to do the kinds of initiatives that we think are absolutely essential? And it's a dialogue I believe that we do need to seriously engage because everything is going to boil back down to that. My brother mentioned about what they're telling us in the schools. He who pays the piper keep wanting to call the truth. And unless we are able to be economically independent and strengthen the base, and the church can do that in a greater way, so that we do not have to be dictated to by others, because we have the kind of fundamental base to drive the vehicle and not become a passenger that is dragged along in it. And I think there are some ideas we need to talk about how we can share together to build a parallel system of economic strength for projects called Church of Money and Praise the Lord. All right, um, I don't know if there's anybody else with an idea of how we may, is that on the same note or something else? Well, it's, it's interesting some of the things that was brought up. Okay. Good morning, is it afternoon? Yes, afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Camila De John, um, a Jamaican who is recently returned home. Um, one of the things I've tried to do over the last nearly year is to talk to people from all walks of life and to try and engage and relearn about my home. My understanding is one of the ways I think the diaspora and the churches can work together and if we do not begin to address um, education as a manifestation, part of the poverty in Jamaica, then whatever else we're going to do is not going to be sustainable. Um, my understanding is for the children who go to secondary school, only 
Savior Jesus. Now, if we are talking about economic development and sustainability, how do we begin to do that when only 30% of our children are sitting there, Jesus? There has to be something that we work to ensure that there's a broader education because we're not talking just about academic education. We are talking about education in terms of family. What does being in a family mean now? What, where is the, the moral uh, basis? And that doesn't mean necessarily about following uh, Christianity. What does Christianity in itself provided a moral base for all of us at the beginning? If you do not have family life, when someone tells me that um, I needed money, I could pay the rent, but I couldn't find the food, and a man could give me the money, right? It's as simple as that. It's nothing going on but the rent. So we need to address some of the basic ed education, the poverty of education, the poverty of just living. We need, to, we need to be engaged in the diaspora, in its position, can begin to engage the government, and I know some people do, about structural changes. Because some of the levels of poverty that I have seen has been shocking at any level. And I think we need to look at that because no matter what we do here and from here, if we do not begin to see some of that, which we don't see when we're on holiday, we don't, we may see a little bit, but when you live and talk to people, when I have to sit and cry in St. Anne's Bay because a 12-year-old is telling me he works in the supermarket from Thursday to Saturday so he can get money to go to school. That is the reality. And the realities of life in Jamaica for a lot of our people begins you know, with poverty at a level that you and I could never have imagined. Please, That's, you need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and in all those premises and corners, the church is present, right? In all those situations, I can guarantee you, churches are right there. We'll take this as the last one. Yes? Yes, I will be rather happy with the independent churches of Jamaica. No, I heard um, uh, Dr. Dunbar saying, and another gentleman, that you know, it is the responsibility of parents to inculcate the right values and attitudes. And I'm in agreement with that, except that we have a problem. The problem is that many of the parents themselves are not prepared. And so because they're not prepared, because children are having children, their social situation is hostile as it is at home. And the mother is very, who is a parent, is very preoccupied with putting food on the table. The, the, the space for inculcating values and attitudes just don't exist. So it, is, it comes back to the church. We just have to see the need. Yet in the wards, in the communities, and be the fathers that are absent. But when we go into the church, when we go into the wards, we're talking about hungry and needy children. So we have to carry food and clothes. And here's the problem. When a church gets five barriers as a gift and they go to carry it, and they have to six of those dollars, they're left with the idea. They may have to walk away and leave those six of barriers. So there is a cycle of things that needs to be sorted out so that it makes the work of the church, because the diaspora wants to help. They send the stuff and they end up being left on the wall. Right. Because the church can't afford it. There's one thing. The right. The time is against us. But one thing, though, we need to bear in mind that there is um, a charitable organization status that churches can apply for. Um, and we need to make sure we do our homework so that we can benefit from what is available so that those barriers do not get lost and walk. So there's, so there's something we can do to position ourselves so that we can serve and we can challenge what our sisters and brothers are able to get to us from overseas so that it goes to the people who are in need. So we can do that and definitely we have to take the church into the home and not wait for the home to come to church, eh? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we could spend much more time talking about these issues, but we don't have the time. I want to thank our panel, 
Then I will have our pilot piece put our hands together for them. And I show that this has ignited some further conversation that will take place as we look at some of these practical ways of how the church in the diaspora and Jamaica may impact the socioeconomic situation here in Jamaica. Thank you very much.